what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel not welcome back go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed unless of course you know your taste level is lacking y'all know what i started saying that as a joke you know on the channel it's like a little kiki between me and my family here but i saw a comment the other day and it was so bothered by that they were like why would you say something like that you have to insult people i'm like girl you this is the internet girl this is a social media app relax you're doing a lot okay it's unwarranted i'm not for the people who who don't have a sense of humor anyway so now, if y'all follow me on instagram you already know the issues i was going through the other day what was it thursday i filmed this video got up to edit it thought it was going to be out thursday evening i think the video was close to an hour but the last like maybe 10 minutes it was slightly out of focus like just by a, a little bit i'll put some footage here for y'all to see what I'm talking about. But I was like, the girls are not about to eat me up for being out of focus for these 10, 15 minutes. I am not in the mood for it. It irritated me and I was like, I'm just gonna scrap it, refilm it, cause that's how I was feeling. And it'll be up Tuesday. So here I am trying to film this again with the construction of Houston in my background, but we are gonna try to get through it. Cause I gotta get the story off my books. Before I get started, did y'all check me out on Sherilyn Dale's channel? We did a podcast together, an episode. Let me be clear. It's her podcast. I guessed it on the podcast. And I had a great time. It's a really cool concept. She is another true crime content creator. Most of you probably already know. And she has added a podcast to her channel. The title is So Cute. It's Murder with Friends. And she is having us true crime content creators come guest on the channel and just talk about ourselves and what we do and all of the things. And with me personally, we got more so into like my mental health journey which i've been really open with you guys over here on this channel but we really got into it like from the start we got into it really deep so it was a really good episode i really enjoyed it if you haven't you should check it out i'll put it in the i cards i have fun i plan on going back our conversation just flows it just it just flows and it was a good time and so i'm looking forward to doing it again in the future but i'm gonna let the other girls get their little turn first you know before i step back in line for seconds also one thing that i do want to address before I get started is I see a lot of people in the comments asking this one question and I've addressed it before on my channel but it was when I had a much smaller audience so I don't think many people know like I guess the information just expired child I don't know but the number one question I get on my channel is where are the sponsors why don't you have sponsors you need to have sponsors a lot of people are under the impression that i do not get offered sponsorship opportunities i mean i understand that when you don't see them one could assume that i don't get them right i definitely love y'all a lot first of all because y'all go to bed for me like i have seen y'all in the comment section tagging me in posts of some of these companies who work with a lot of like content creators. It's a couple of brands y'all didn't seen on everybody's channel. And I see y'all on Instagram tagging me talking about y'all need to work with her. And sometimes I'm just like, ew, they offered me something and I respectfully declined. So this is awkward. So let me tell y'all why I don't get sponsors or don't have sponsors on the channel. So I've always felt like product pushing is not my ministry and it's not something I wanted to do. And that came from a particular experience that I had before I began creating content and I was just, you know, a consumer, a viewer. There was this influencer who I loved then and still love now. What happened was this person had a sponsor video and they are advertising this product and they're like, throw all the other ones away. This one is it. Like this is the one that you need. You don't need any other product that, you know, does this function. This is the one girl, this is what we're using. And so I was like, okay, went out and spent my $69 plus tax on this item, right? And I got it and it was okay. And the thing is, your opinion of a product doesn't always have to be the same. Like it's subjective, right? It could be that that person really did love the product and it's their end all be all and it just didn't work for me. But that wasn't the case because within a couple of uploads they came back with another product that served the same functionality as the other product and was like this is the one and i'm like but girl i thought the other one was the one what happened i didn't spend my 69 dollars plus tax girl plus shipping and now we on to something something new in, in, in just a couple of videos like i'm confusion and then I realized like, as they continue to, you know, have these sponsorships, I'm just like, wait a minute, this is just for a check. Like this is just product pushing. And like I said, I still love 
this person's content. No shade and all love to them. It was really no love lost at all. It was just the realization that some people will get on camera and say, you should buy this. I love this just for money, like a check. With me, I really, really value my integrity. Like it just means too much for me to really sit in front of a camera and say, hey, I love this. You should go get it knowing Girl, I'm either unfamiliar with the product, don't like the product for real, like I just cannot. And then I don't wanna do that to y'all because people work hard for their money and so I just wouldn't even feel right telling you to go spend your money on something, right? That I did not 1000% stand behind. So because I have now decided to open the door to doing sponsored videos, I wanna let y'all know a couple of things, right? For one, most importantly, please do not feel obligated to make any purchases for anything. Consider it like a regular old commercial while you're sitting down watching TV. And I've decided to open the door to sponsorship opportunities for a couple of reasons. One, as you guys may or may not know, true crime content creators get flagged like crazy, okay? Demonetized like crazy because YouTube does not want you describing or talking about any type of situation where anybody was harmed or hurt. And so we have to be really careful how we describe things in the words that we say because certain words are flagged. It has been the ugliest little struggle to describe to you a crime scene or the actions of some of these horrific people I talk about and do so without being demonetized and flagged. It is a struggle, like it really is. That is the number one reason, honestly, why I've decided to open up the doors to sponsorships because YouTube likes to play. And if they decide, you know what, yeah, mm -mm, we're gonna snatch the monetization off of that. It's like a safety net, so to speak. So I don't have to worry about, oh, I'm not being paid for this. Or I put all this energy and work and effort into this video and now like I literally just won't even be seeing any kind of compensation for it. So you will be seeing some sponsor content in the near future and I just want to let you know right here, right now, girl, please do not feel pressured to make a purchase. However, that does not mean I'm gonna be on here advertising grape tomatoes and mops, okay? It is definitely gonna have to be something that I genuinely believe in. I'm still only going to work with brands that I genuinely believe in. And if it's not something that I would recommend to my, my, my sisters or my friends, I definitely will not be recommending it to you because y'all my people and I love y'all. And so without further ado, let's just get into the video. One more thing I wanna address before we get into the story, y'all. Examama is here, okay? I am in Examama mode and I have breakouts on my face. You only can see this one, I think, on the camera, this patch. It's like a little strip right here that's flaky, but it's the color of my skin. This, you're probably gonna see all the way up until the last second of the video. Because for whatever reason, when you try to put on makeup over eczema, which I typically don't do, but I had, an outing to go to where I needed to look like something. And so I tried, honey, I don't know, it just flakes up and it acts really weird and you might see it, I'm gonna do my best. But typically I try not to even put anything on my face other than moisturizer, of course, you know, a cleanser when I have an outbreak, so. Makeup over eczema is not my ministry, but I'm gonna do my best today. Y'all know I like to switch it up every now and then on my channel to give y'all a break from the typical template of childhood, adulthood, crime, aftermath. I like to throw a, a bank robbery story in there every now and then, a cult story, something different, right? So yeah, today's video is gonna have a slight little change of pace and without further ado, let's just get right into it. So I hope I got those on equal, okay? If not, it's not the end of the world. My makeup is getting washed off right after this video cause child, I'm really only doing this for y'all and come Thursday, if I still have this going on, then honey, I'm gonna see y'all next Tuesday, just so you know. In 1998, single divorcee Christine is still trying to adjust to the single life and also being a single mother. However, she is at the point where she has been single for a while and so now she is ready to entertain the idea of dating. The problem is Miss Christine is Mormon and living in Michigan, I guess there aren't many people who share her same beliefs. And so it is extremely difficult for her to find a fellow Mormon man for her to settle down with. So she decides to expand her horizons and take that one filter out. He does not have to be a Mormon man. With that requirement out of the window, she now has many more options and decides to go the route of online dating. Now she meets a young man on the internet Internet. The two of them begin spending a lot of time together and they're enjoying each other's company. But unfortunately, it's like more of a situationship 
with benefits than a relationship. Now she knows this is not in alignment with her Mormon faith. And so over time, she begins to feel a little guilty about it. Just knowing what they had going on was not right. And eventually it gets bad enough for her to decide, you know what, I need to end this relationship right here, right now and go repent for my sins because this is not it. I'm not trying to go to hell with you, sir. Like this is a good time, but it's not at all worth what it will cost me. Okay, if I keep this up. So she breaks it off with the man and she has no choice but to now go and confess her sins to the bishop. Now she knew, of course, that there would be some kind of punishment for her behavior, but she was not expecting the punishment that she got. When the bishop came back to her after he had prayed about it and thought about it for some time, and he tells her that because of her relationship with this man, she will now be excommunicated from the church altogether. Christine takes this extremely hard because if you do not know, within the Mormon faith, it is believed that you'll continue to be a family unit in the afterlife. So if you have like children and a husband, like they'll be your eternal family and you guys will remain together over on the other side. Now being excommunicated meant that that is no longer a benefit of Christine. Her poor children will spend all of eternity without her and vice versa. She'll have to spend it without them. And her being a mother, hearing this or knowing this is terrifying. She's literally willing to do anything to get back into the good graces of the Mormon community and church and turn this whole thing around. She gets baptized again. She attends church every Sunday and it takes literally years in order for her to, for one, forgive herself and also receive forgiveness from the church as well. However, once she reaches that point, it's still not the same as it was before. It didn't feel the same, but she just felt like she was still walking around the church with a little scarlet letter A on her sleeve or wherever says what a scarlet letter. And carrying around that shame was embarrassing and uncomfortable. Then one night, Christine has a very vivid dream. And in this dream, a man comes to her and he tells her how he is this great love of her life and that he is waiting for her and eager for them to spend all of eternity together. This dream was so vivid. It felt so real that she said that the following day when she woke up, she literally was looking around like, where is he at? She expected him to be there almost. And in the days following, she couldn't even shake like the, the thoughts of the dream. She just kept daydreaming about it. And it gets to the point where she begins to question if it is in fact just a dream. Like, is it a sign, an omen maybe that this great love of her life is out there and waiting on her? Now, what she was not open to doing is what she had done before. She was not open to having a fling with anybody. She was not about to risk her life on the other side for another man. Her going against her Mormon faith and belief system was just out of the question, period. And she felt as though... If she was going to meet this man in Michigan, she probably would have met him by now. So she decides to pack up her children and move them to Utah where there is this huge Mormon community. She gets there in the year 2000. She settles in. She is familiarizing herself with the new neighborhood. Her children are also adjusting well. And so the move felt really good. Like it felt like finally she was exactly where she was meant to be in life. She even makes a couple of friends, one of which invites her to a Mormon's singles event to give her the opportunity to get out there and mingle with some eligible Mormon bachelors, if you will. Which she is, of course, open to because she is out here trying to move forward with her life and meet her a nice man. Now, the event was kind of like Mormon Mingle, live. There was dancing, a lot of conversation being had, a lot of laughter, plenty of singles, both male and female. And Christine is enjoying herself, making her rounds around the party, just having casual conversation. But she is taken aback completely when she scans the room and her eyes land on a man that looks really familiar to her. At first, she really couldn't put her finger on where she could have known him from. Like, have I, have I passed you on aisle three down to the grocery store? Are you my Amazon delivery man? Like, where do I, where could I have known you from? Why do you feel so familiar? And then it hits her. This guy is literally identical to the young man from her dream. This great love of her life who said he was out there waiting on her in the world. And so at this point, she is like, okay, I have to get his attention. So at least introduce herself, find out his name, have a little conversation, something. And so she makes her way through the event headed toward his way. 
Now, after standing close by and giving him the eye, he finally comes over and introduces himself to her. She, of course, introduces herself to him as well, but not long into this conversation. He hits her with a bombshell that just sinks her little heart. Now, although he is at a singles event for Mormons, he is not a Mormon, at least not anymore. He is now actually an atheist. He tells her about how he had once belonged to the Mormon church and how he has since decided to abandon that particular set of beliefs and really all religious beliefs or the idea of a supreme being altogether. And she listens to him speak about his journey and what brought him to his current idea. Now she is sitting there just listening to him tell her about his journey, completely full of disappointment, right? And then all of a sudden a light bulb goes off in her head and she has this idea that maybe he is meant for me. Like maybe he really is this great love of my life, but maybe I am meant to bring him back to God, bring him back to the Mormon faith. Perhaps this is my purpose in life, to complete this mission. So she says to him, maybe I'll be the one to bring you back to God. And to that, he responds, or maybe I'll be the one to show you that there is no God. Child. Christine silently accepts this as a personal challenge and decides instead of throwing this little fish back in the sea, she was going to take him home and try to nurse him back to the Lord. At this point, the conversation shifts to other topics and they spend the rest of the event getting to know each other and enjoying each other's company. Now, at the end of it, the two of them decide to exchange contact information and decide, you know, we're going to see each other again. Let's schedule a time for us to meet up, be alone and enjoy each other. The day comes for their next date and the more they talk the more enchanted christine is becoming by steve i have not said his name yet steve he is such a great conversationalist he makes her laugh he makes her think and he seems to have a genuine interest in getting to know her as a person and the things you know that she likes and wants out of life now i don't know if she asked him what he was doing down to the Mormon mingle if he was now an atheist. Initially, the date is going really well, but about two hours into good conversation and good vibes, Steve tries to push up on Christine a little bit and she is like, okay, see, no. I've made it so very clear what my boundaries are and I do not appreciate you trying to, you know, overstep them. Now, her reaction to this is very indicative to how she is feeling and what she's thinking. And he notices this, that she is uncomfortable. And he tells her, I've broken the faith of every woman that I've dated. And you'll be no different. Now, I don't know what kind of foreplay talk he thought that was, but it definitely didn't, didn't help him out. Because she becomes very upset and she tells him that literally no man will make her break her faith ever. Like, it's, it's just not happening. Now, at this point, admittedly, had he not been the man from her dreams, like if she was not convinced that this was him, she would have left this date and never spoken to him again. But she really believes that this is her purpose. Like it's a mission from God himself to bring this man back into the light. That is something that obviously would not be easy to do. And so she decides that she's going to just stick with it, keep pushing and see it through. Which it also helps that he does apologize at this point when he realizes that she is very very upset by what he was doing and saying and he also seemed very sincere in his apology and so she accepts it and decides you know that they'll just put this whole uncomfortable transaction behind them in the following weeks the two of them continue to go on dates and little outings that give them the opportunity to really get to know each other and spend a lot of time together and she's becoming increasingly comfortable with Steve so much so that she's ready to have him over to the house for dinner and also introduce him to her children. This would be yet another test for him because of course she really wants her kids to to like him and how he interacts with them like if he's a patient if he's kind these are all things that really matter a lot to her when choosing a partner to be with and this is a test that he passes with flying colors he spends the evening making them laugh, really engaging with the children. The kids love him and this makes Christine love him even more. They are now at a point where this is her man. She is completely comfortable with him and comfortable with their relationship. And so she decides that 
it's a good opportunity or good time to tell him about the dream. Now, up until this point, she had not opened up to him about the dream because she wasn't sure how he would take it. Like, will he think I'm weird? Will he think it's strange? Will he think I'm crazy? Because sure, I wouldn't have told him this dream if it was me personally. I would have taken his dream down to the grave. But I'm not Christina. Christina's not me. And so she tells Steve about the dream. She tells him that one evening she had prayed really long and hard for another chance at love somebody who was meant for her and will love and cherish her the way that she needs to be and then she had gone to bed that night and had the dream about him he does not have much of a reaction to this dream to her surprise and to my surprise as well he doesn't react as if she had told him anything that was strange or out of the ordinary the two of them just continue their course of dating and allowed their relationship to just naturally and organically progress. But a couple weeks down the line, the hormone monster rears its ugly head again and Steve attempts to seduce Christine a second time. The two of them are alone at home, just Netflixing and chilling. When he begins to caress her and the caress and slowly goes into, you know, some areas that they should not be in, he then attempts to kiss her and at this point, she is like, okay, no, here you go again, trying to jeopardize my spot in heaven and I cannot allow it, okay? She has been very, very clear that she is not willing to be intimate before marriage. And so she reminds him of this and also how serious she is about abiding to the, the Mormon rules. She was not about to make that same mistake, especially considering how much she had to do to get back into the good graces of the Mormon church. Christine decides to just cut her losses. Like, you know what? This is not going to work. Like, I cannot continue to jeopardize my religion fooling with this man. Right then and there, she tells him that she does not believe this will work and she thinks that they should just go ahead and part ways and now. And upon hearing all of this, he becomes very teary-eyed and tells her that they cannot break up because she is the first woman to ever make the numbness in his heart go away. And not only that, she cannot leave him because he has a confession to make. You see, he is not really an atheist at all. He is actually a prophet. And that dream that she told him about that had him in it, he had already known about this dream before she told him. It wasn't just a dream. He came to her as the prophet that he is through a dream to tell her that she is meant to be his eternal wife and make sure she gets on the little path that will bring her to him. Now, in the Book of Mormon, from what I gather, in the end of days, a new prophet is said to come to earth with the task of translating the final testament of Jesus Christ. He tells her that he is, in fact, that prophet. And at this point, she is questioning whether or not this could be true. Like, I believe in the Mormon word, but are you just saying this, sir, so I don't break up with you? Like, I just, I need clarity. And he can tell and sense that she is not quite sold on this idea. And so he offers to prove it to her. He has already begun the translation and he can send her what he has so far to prove it by email. They wrap up their date with the understanding that he was going to go home and send this over to her right away. So she, you know, can be confident that he is telling her the truth. Now, child, hours go by, all the night goes by and Christine has not received an email. The following morning, though, she checks her email again and lo and behold, there is an email from Stephen titled For Your Eyes Only. She opens it and looks, and there it is, the first eight chapters translated. For her, this was confirmation. She is excited. She is impressed and also honored to have been chosen to be the prophet's eternal wife. That's a, that's a big deal. And she had been so solid in her faith up until that point, you know, despite that little mishap, that she would be chosen because aside from that, she was really living according to how she should as a Mormon woman. She spends the next few hours reading over all eight chapters. And by the time she finishes, all doubt is erased from her mind. She is completely convinced that Stephen is the prophet and she will be the prophet's wife. She calls him up and tells him that she believes him. And she is just so excited for their future together, their eternity together, and just to also be a part of such an amazing event 
And he warns her that it is extremely important that she keep all of this information to herself. She is not to confide in a single soul about the things that he has told her and sent her via email. The work he is doing here is the most important work and it cannot be jeopardized by anyone for any reason. Now this is of course understandable to her and so she agrees not to tell anyone about it. The last thing you want to be in history is the one who messed up the prophet's mission with the understanding that they are meant to be united as one husband and wife. The two of them make plans to go to Vegas two weeks later to unite their souls on Christmas Day. She makes arrangements for the kids to spend Christmas with their father and she makes the arrangements for her to spend Christmas down to the altar with Steve. However, her and Steve had two different things in mind. She arrives to Vegas with the expectation that they're about to go down to the chapel and get married. But Steve tells her there in the hotel room, I'm the prophet, like I don't have to go through an ordained minister or a chapel or a church to get married. Like that's worldly mortal stuff. I'm on a different level. So he tells her that the process is he simply just picks a wife. They consummate as man and wife and then boom, she's his wife officially for the rest of their lives and all of eternity. It's just that simple. Anything else would just make it hard and complicated for no reason. Now this does not sound too far-fetched to believe. It kind of makes sense. And so Christine decides, you know what? Okay. The two of them have an adult exchange. They consummate as man and wife, spend the rest of their weekend there in join Vegas, and then they return home. And once they get home, Christine is hit yet again with another gut-wrenching blow because Steve lets her know that they will not return home and be living as man and wife under the same roof. No, they have to keep this marriage a secret. They cannot risk any of the things being exposed. And so they will have to continue to live their lives under separate roofs as they have before. Additionally, they will not be changing any last names or doing really any of the things that married couples do besides, you know, let's see. Yet again, this is something that she really doesn't question. She feels like it makes perfect sense because according to her in the Mormon religion, anything that is sacred to you, you keep secret. And so if their marriage and this mission is so sacred, then of course they would keep it a secret. Although this is not what she wants, she feels like it is in line with the Mormon faith and this story of him being the prophet. And so she just decides from that aspect, she understands why it has to be this way. So the two of them return to their respective homes and he comes by the house frequently to spend time with her and the kids. And spending more time at Christine's house, he is learning more things about her. And one thing that he had picked up on was the fact that she had a very lucrative business proposal on the table. And in discussing this business opportunity with her husband, she reveals to him that she plans on giving a portion of it to a nonprofit organization. Not long after this, Steve comes over to the house to tell her that he yet again has something that he needs to share with her. He actually has a nonprofit organization of his own for women and children. And there is another woman, a believer who knows everything about him and what he is here doing, knows about his work, who is the admin of the organization, Sister Jackson. Now, Christine does not really think this is anything to question or anything strange or odd. She is actually impressed by this and very eager to meet Sister Jackson. And she is also ready to help his organization in any way that she can, including making his organization the charity that receives her donation from the business deal if it goes through. But Steve tells her that it is not... The best idea that she meets Sister Jackson, at least not now, not until he finishes his translations. And again, she is disappointed. However, she understands and she agrees to wait. Something else that he wanted to discuss with her was the fact that they had way too many things inside the house. Like looking at all of these extra possessions that they had that were not necessary, he felt as though it was not really appropriate being that they were Mormon because you're supposed to be living this modest lifestyle. And when you have more, you're supposed to give more instead of buy more for yourself. And child, Christine had been doing her best to be the best 
Mormon woman that she could. So hearing this, that she had been doing something wrong, especially from the prophet himself, she feels really bad that she's bought all these extra worldly possessions. So when he suggests that they sell all of it and take that money and put it toward the organization, she is all for it. Now, it didn't feel too good seeing a lot of her luxury items go, but she did feel a little better knowing that the proceeds will go toward helping mothers and children who are in need. And then literally days after she had sold all of their extra possessions, because it wasn't just her things, it was the kids extra possessions as well. Steve shares something amazing with her that he had uncovered in his work. He had discovered her name in his translations, and she is said to have been one of the most righteous women who have ever walked the earth. The ancient prophets had known her and had written about her, and this is just mind-blowing to hear. It feels amazing to know she was a main character out here in these streets, and not just a little prophet's wife. He then warns her that the rest of her story will come with some tests that would not be comfortable for her at all. For one, she'll be degraded and belittled by many men. So Bella came and interrupted me. She was making a lot of noise and in an effort to quiet her down, I gave her something to chew, but the mic picked it up. So you'll hear her chewing in the background for the next couple of minutes. My bad. But it's the lesser of two evils. According to him, she would need to have relations with other men so that he could test his jealousy. Now, of course, she becomes extremely upset hearing this. She is like, okay, is this real? Are you just using this as an excuse to push me into the arms of other men? Are you trying to pull away from me? But he reassures her that this is certainly not the case whatsoever. He claims that God is actually testing him to make sure that he does not love her more than the work that he is there to do. And that's not even all of it. She is not just to sleep with these men. She is to do it for money, to then fund the organization. Baby, if this is not the longest, most drawn out recruit made, made by a pimp. A pimp tried to recruit me once, but that's a story for another day. I was in a Memphis neighborhood, Walmart, in the frozen food section by the Biscuits Child, and it was a very unnerving experience to say the least, but I got myself out of it. I pretended like I was calling somebody I was in the store with, that they were over in produce, and I'm like, girl, where you at, girl? Here I come, to kind of get away from them. But anyway, this ain't about me. It's about Christine, so let me get back to the story. Now, she tells that, um, yeah, this is just beyond me. I don't see myself being comfortable with this ever. I don't think this is something that I can do or that I'm built for. Like, I'm not, I'm not the woman for the job, not for this job. And he asks her one question that really puts things in perspective for her and makes her reconsider. Do you want to spend eternity with your children? Hearing that question kind of reels her back in and she begins to think about it. Like, am I really going to sit here and turn down a mission from God and the prophet himself? Like, no, I don't want to do this, but... Is it worth not spending all of eternity with my children? As upset as she is, as turned off as she is by the thought of laying with all these strangers for money, the thought of her and her children being separated in the afterlife is enough to change her mind, at least get her into the space where she agrees to try. She agrees to do whatever it is that she has been appointed to do per his translation. Within days, the two of them have an entire operation up and running and a whole schedule of men to come in to be with Christine. Now, Christine is not enjoying this at all, but she is just doing her best to see it through, right? But right when she begins to kind of come to terms with what she is doing comes her next test. And this one is the worst one thus far. Steve comes over to tell her that he has received more instructions for her from God. And God wants her to give up her children. Steve tells her that in order for her to be with them in heaven, she needs to put God before them now. Now, this is, of course, the very last thing that she wants to do. She cannot believe that she is being asked to sacrifice in this way. However, she also believes that she is being given God's directions. And so she goes home, has a conversation with her children, letting them know that they will be going away for a while. She also contacts her ex-husband and tells him that she needs him to come get the kids and raise them from here. And without the children there in the home, Steve doesn't really see a use for her to have this 
huge six bedroom house that she has. Not with it just being her there. And yet again, she is not living so modest. He convinces her to move out of her home and sell it and move all of her belongings into a hotel. And he knows just the spot. It's one that is affordable. There's just enough space for her and she could peacefully conduct her business right there from her hotel room without being interrupted. Now, does she wanna do this? Is she happy about it? No, but he reassures her that all of her sacrifices will be rewarded immensely. And with that, she decides to continue to have faith and continue playing her part. Because Christina had been doing so well and she had been bringing in a good amount of money, not doing much complaining, if any complaining at all, he decides once she moves to the hotel that she could be in charge of her own scheduling and really just conduct her business as she saw fit as long as she meets a quota, a certain quota that he had given her. He would also told her that he expected her to deposit this said amount of money every week into his bank account, which was a bank account for the organization. And as long as the money is deposited on time, Steve is happy. Now, unbeknownst to him, as soon as he had given Christine this amount of freedom she had stopped working what she was doing is taking her own money from her personal bank account and depositing that amount that quoted quota every week into his account and as long as the money is deposited Stephen doesn't have any complaints but as more time goes by she is seeing him less and less at one point it had been weeks than she had seen or heard from Steve. And she gets a call from him, a collect call, where he tells her that he's in jail and that's where he's been and why she had not heard from him. He does not tell her what for, he just makes it clear that he needs her to come down to the jail to see him right away so that they can discuss some things in person. When she gets there, all he will really reveal about why he was arrested is allegedly his ex-wife had made some false accusations against him, yet he still does not let her know what these false accusations are. But according to him, that's not even important. What's important is that he needs her to bring in more money to not only continue to fund this organization, but also help him get out of jail. He cannot continue to do his translations from behind the bars. Now my thing is, are you a prophet? You didn't prophesize that they were about to come round you up? Like I'm confusion. See, that's why it wouldn't work because my mouth's too smart. Now, when she asked him if he needed her to, you know, find him a lawyer or act on his behalf to do anything other than get money for him to be released, he tells her, no, Sister Jackson has been appointed my power of attorney. She is handling all of the things. All I need you to do is play your role, which is as the money maker. He also tells her that he had chosen that particular hotel for a reason. He has eyes all around it. People are watching her day in and day out. And going forward, they will be reporting all of her movements to him until he gets out of jail. This is actually the worst time for him to be asking for more money, considering the fact that she has just gotten down to the last little bit of what was left in her account. So at this point, she really does have to get back to work. And she spends the next couple of weeks trying to meet his request but then something within her all of a sudden began to question whether or not this is real or is this a scam? And the more she thinks about it, the more she realizes that he hasn't done a single solitary thing other than show her those eight chapters translated to prove that he is a prophet, that he is anything more than a man, a regular old man. The more she thinks about it, the more she becomes convinced that she has certainly been bamboozled a child and has been tricked into this life. And so she writes him a little old prison letter, mails it off. And the letter is telling him that she's just pretty much done with this whole thing. She would no longer be participating in his work or whatever he has going on. And basically this letter here is goodbye. Once he gets her little letter in the mail and he reads it, he calls her immediately and begs her for the opportunity to just prove himself like give me a chance to prove myself to you because I can he also tells her that there is another believer there at the jail that he wants her to meet she agrees to go down to the jail and have a conversation with this person who is actually Steve's cellmate Brian and in this this meeting or this visitation session 
He tells Christine that she does not need to give up, that she needs to continue believing in Steve and his work, and he is definitely not lying. Steve has to be the real deal because in the middle of the night, he had awakened to Steve in the cell with this huge white light glowing all around him, like this angelic aura. And she asked him at that point, like, are you just like, did he tell you to say this? Are you just going along? What's going on? But Brian assures her that he is not just making this all up. Literally everything that he said to her was in fact true. And because of it, he is now a believer himself. After days of thinking about how much she had been forced to give up, what she had been forced to do against her will, Christine feels a sense of relief knowing that all of these sacrifices had not been in vain. Steve was in fact the real deal and Brian had seen it with his own two eyes. With her faith now restored in Steven, she returns to her work earning money to support the organization and to also, of course, earn the extra for Steve to be able to get out of jail. A month goes by with very little change. He is still in jail and she is still working and depositing the money into his account. And then she receives a letter in the mail from Sister Jackson. The letter is to inform Christine that Adam is at the point of his work where he is able to publicly claim and take a wife. And reading this, Christine is overjoyed. This is the moment that, well, one of the moments that she's been waiting for. And she is finally at the point in which they can go public until she gets down to the part of the letter where it states that he would publicly be claiming Miss Jackson, Sister Jackson, as his wife and not Christine. This, of course, is some of the worst news that Sister Jackson or anybody could be sharing with her at this point. So she goes down to the jail right away to have a meeting with Mr. Steve. Even still though, she's holding out hope that this is a misunderstanding or that it is not true. Worst case scenario, it is true, but she can somehow change his mind and convince him to, you know, claim her. But when she gets there, he tells her that this is God's plan. It's not his, and it's not Sister Jackson, and it's not for her to decide that it is not the way that things should go, and that she should not even be questioning it, and that he surely had nothing to do with the decision. And the only thing that she needs to concern herself with is whether or not she is bringing in enough money. He then proceeds to tell her that she should feel empowered by her position, and the fact that she is a part of such important work and the bottom line is this will be the extent of the role that she plays until she is no more and she needs to just come to terms with that end of discussion not the outcome she was hoping for and so she just gathers her things and returns back down to her hotel room weeks later brian the other believer from jail he shows up at christine's hotel room door unannounced he had been released from prison obviously. She was happy to see a familiar face, especially when she is told that he would be, you know, there to watch over her, to help protect her. But in actuality, Steve had just sent him there to have relations with Christine for free, just one on the house after he's released. Steven had also told Brian that she was expecting it, like it was, you know, okay. They do the do, and afterward, Brian notices pictures on our nightstand of these small children. And he asks, you know, like, are these your nieces, your nephews? Like, who, who are they? She tells him, no, these are my children. She then goes on to tell him the message that she had gotten from God, that she needed to give them up, and how he knows, just like she knows, that this is very important work. And she is more than willing to do whatever God needed her to do, including being without them for now. Hearing all of this, Brian is taken aback a little bit. He tells her that he needs to step outside for some fresh air, but he leaves and does not return for hours. The truth is, Brian was not at all a believer of Stevens. He was just a cellmate who had gotten cool with him. Stephen had actually told him 
him the truth about everything except for the fact that he had Christine give her children up. And the fact that this woman was being taken advantage of like this and she was a mother to three small children really did not sit well with Brian. He felt really bad, really guilty that he had come over, slept with her and had gone along with the whole thing. Especially considering she had gotten to the point where she was ready to leave Stephen alone and leave this whole life behind her. And he was the reason that she decided to instead continue her relationship with Steve. Hours later, he returns to Christine's hotel room and he is not alone. He actually has Sister Jackson with him. Brian had decided to clear his conscience by coming clean and not only telling Christine about the things that he had lied to her about, but literally everything that Steve had told her, which was all a lie. Well, most of it, 99% of it. The only thing that he told her that was the truth was the fact that he was an atheist. Everything after that, have been alive. He just got this idea one day to completely mind fuck a Mormon woman and got a thrill out of telling her all of these lies and feeding her this grand story, watching her agree to all of the crazy things that he was telling her to do and trying to see just how far he could push her. Like how long will she believe this lie? And in that time, how much would she be willing to do? And although he found that in itself to be quite entertaining, after a while, it just wasn't enough. And so he decided then to add the element of trafficking to kick it up a notch. And as for Sister Jackson, she is, of course, not at all who Steve had painted her out to be either. She was no believer of his, no admin over this invisible organization which does not exist of course she is actually his fiance and she was in on the whole thing he was the one who had concocted the whole plan and did everything she was just aware of everything that was going on and really just sitting back reaping the benefits of christine's weekly deposits and i do not know her exact age but according to christine she looked to be a very very young girl she is also an atheist if that is relevant to anyone. She is extremely apologetic to Christine and offers her one last apology before she and Brian leave the hotel room. Brian actually advises that Christine leave that hotel room right away. And so as soon as they leave, she leaves as well with very little money and no idea where she's even going. After of course she leaves the police station. Now, unfortunately, when she reports this whole ordeal to the local law enforcement, they tell her that it is literally nothing that they can do about it because she believed him and did everything on her own free will. They also tell her that even if she tried to sue him, it wouldn't be successful because any jury would look at her situation and have the same sentiments that she did everything on her own free will and that she is partially to blame because she believed him which i found to be interesting because there are like s trafficking laws and i don't know like do you have to be knocked over the head and thrown in the back of a van for that to qualify as trafficking or do you have to be like threatened not to leave Maybe that made the difference because I think with trafficking, you are like held captive to a degree, you know, and she could have walked away had she not fallen for his manipulation. So maybe that's the difference. Real quick, y'all know I'm not a blush girl. Y'all have never seen me wear blush on this channel. Not in a single solitary video. I do not wear blush. I've never even purchased a blush for myself. However, Rare Beauty has sent me like literally all of their blushes. And so I've been playing with them in the background, girl behind y'all's back and I don't know mama might be a blush girl now because I've been liking it lately now of course that was the last thing that she wanted to hear down to the police station so after leaving there she decides to just instead of focusing on getting any kind of justice or retaliation getting her lick back for the things that he has cost her over the months she shifts her focus toward getting herself back together getting her children back and getting her life back on track 
how it was before she had even met Steven. And over the following months, she manages to achieve that. So y'all, this has been my experience. I'll put on the blush and I'll be feeling real cute and pretty and dainty. And then I catch a glimpse of myself later on and I'm like, girl, you look like a baby doll. Like, are you sure about this blush thing? I don't know. For the most part though, I really like it. And so I think, I think she's here to stay. Since this horrible experience dating Steven, she has met herself a nice, wholesome man, a good man, Savannah, and settled down with him the two of them got married she also does work to help other women who have been victims of trafficking to help raise awareness about the issue and also help them coming out of it with resources that they need to get their life back on track and as for steven he was in jail on unrelated charges and released eventually to presumably find his next victim she never got the opportunity to press charges or anything against him, receive any kind of justice, which I think is unfortunate, but I know some of y'all are gonna share the sentiments of the police officers. And I was like, I get that too, but mm. whichever side of the fence you are on, or if you have a completely different point of view, I would love to read those comments down below. So leave your thoughts down below. Like the video if you enjoyed the content. Don't forget to share it with a friend. We are on the road to 200K and we are quickly approaching. We almost there. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. All this noise back there, like I really hope it's not that loud. Like I really hope so because it sounds like a scene from a Marvel movie. You know, almost every Marvel movie, they're gonna crash and crumble a building, child. That's what it sounds like is going on. It sounds like the Hulk is jumping building to building and them girls are just crashing at his heels. I'm a little upset that I gotta go wash this makeup off cause it's really cute. I feel like I look cute today. Like I really enjoy this look. Granted, I didn't know where it was going when I sat down. I really didn't. I really didn't care that much cause I was like, girl, you gonna wash this off right after anyway. I guess I'll go walk my dogs down the street so somebody can, you know, partake. That I do not get offered sponsor. Ugh. I have not even thought out what I want to look like today. Got to nurse this eczema away. And also receive forgiveness. Is that a word? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. We're not doing this today. I hope y'all can't hear Bella sucking on this little toy underneath my feet. And Chris, I almost called Christian, child. Bella, really? You gonna lick your privates right here, girl, by the, by the mic? The more I tell the story, the more I cannot believe that I'm having to really refilm this. Insane. A second time, especially consider, considering, girl, what? First woman to ever make the numbness in his heart go away. A little lacking on the pickup line there, brother, but I guess. Now, of course, this kind of makes sense to her. So she doesn't question it. She's just like, yeah, yeah tripped over my own tongue now this doesn't sound fine what blue blue sneering so hard in the background my baby sound like he just got off work you're supposed to give more to the uh, and when you have more, that would not be comfortable for it what by many men I know, that's such a sad thing, ain't it? Oh Lord, mommy duties, hold on. I got the thirstiest little dogs on the block. And with that, she decides to keep on. Mm. And one day, after she had not seen nor heard for him, for him, what? What are you talking about? Oof, my lighting is not agreeing with this foundation, but I know this is my color, so you're not about to make me feel some type of way. And she needs to just Accept it. End of this. Yeah. And returns back down to her hotel room slash office. Oh, that's not okay. That is probably not okay. Yep, not okay. I always get so much makeup in my edges. And I'm like the only person I see doing makeup on camera that has this problem. The girls be having clean edges, child, and bronzer all back here. How do they do it? If you know, let me know. What's the secret? By the time I finish filming, it look like my hair star back here. I almost got him Christian again. What? <laughs> Belly, you have really masculine energy to be a cancer. I don't know what that's about. She was not. Uh uh uh. uh. 
she of course is not who he had painted her out to be either of course really bella they can't hear me over here you why do i smell everything oh, chemicals